Technology working. Praise God. That's a good technology. That's a good one? <laughs> oh, I find that thing a lot of times. They get to. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning, brother. No, I remember some years ago at uh, Jesus Place Church with Brother Mike, I had uh, prayed that God would provide something for me to do in the church. And the next uh, day or night that we had gathered, <clears throat> Brother Mike asked for a volunteer without really being specific about what that was. <laughs> and I said, well, God answered my prayer and raised my hand. Amen, <laughs> and uh, turns out he wanted me to do video uh, and uh, audio for for uh, a cable show with Jesus Place Church. And uh, that lasted a little while, but I ended up meeting all kinds of people like Miss Geraldine and Hammond and 
I think there was about seven or eight years I was doing uh, video ministry. And long story short, that all ended up with me being here right now. <laughs> and you know, to this day, when I'm sitting there waiting, looking up here at this pulpit, I think I'm not, I'm not worthy to be up here. And uh, I appreciate Brother Glenn and Brother Mike and all the pastors over the world, because it's hard work. It's a lot of time to get ready for something like this. And so with that, I want to start off with saying that today we're gathered to worship at Mar Paul Baptist Church. Amen? Amen. And I want to say that that name tells a story, a history, that can be traced back a very long way. <coughs> We're in Marpaul and have been serving this community for gospel purposes for over 100 years. Amen? We are Baptists and can trace our roots back to the Protestant Reformation over 500 years ago. We're a church, not a synagogue or a temple, so we can make a connection all the way back to the apostles of Christ 2,000 years ago. And today I would like to preach on the core of what it means to be Protestant, an essential doctrine that was lost and recovered at the Reformation. Let me first clarify what I mean by calling this an essential doctrine. An essential doctrine is part of a belief system that's so vital, so necessary, that if it were abandoned or denied, the whole belief system would fall apart. And I'm talking about our faith in Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. And today I want to talk about salvation by grace, an essential doctrine of our faith. To be more specific, I want to talk about salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 8. And we're going to read through verse 10. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Not from works, so that no one can boast, for we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. And so right there you see all three of the things I just talked about. It says saved by grace. It says through faith. And a little further down it says in Christ. Amen? Now usually the first verse of a believer memorizes is John 3.16. And we don't have to turn there together. I think we could all say it together. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. That's a great verse. Now, last night I googled most memorized verses in the Bible. Of course, we got uh, John 3.16. But Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 did not show up. Now, there's some good ones in there, to be fair. We have, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. We also have Romans 8, 28. And we know that God works all things to the good of them who love them, those who are called according to his purposes. We also have Romans 12, too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. But I wish we would memorize Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, because 
It's so important. Amen. It is a little long, maybe, if we just meditated on it and preached on it a little bit more. That would suffice. So, what do I mean when I say that this is an essential doctrine? Actually, I mean it is salvific, meaning it's essential to our salvation. These verses include all three vital parts of God's plan for, by, for salvation, by grace, through faith, in Jesus. So let us start with the first, grace. Uh, if you want to get ahead, you can go to Romans 5. But before we read that, what? let's talk about what grace isn't, because Ephesians told us that. It said it is not works. Amen? So that no one can boast. When I say works, that means there's nothing you can do to receive God's grace by earning it. Amen? It's a free gift, unmerited. So now let us read Romans 5. We're going to start in verse 6. And we're going to read through verse 11. For while we were still helpless at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God, through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have now received this reconciliation through him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Christ did not die for us because we were good or just, but because God loved us, even while we were still sinners. Now, we did nothing to deserve God's love. To the contrary, we did everything against God. We rebelled against Him. We were per perverted His word. We refused to follow His instructions. But God loved us anyway, and Jesus went to the cross anyway, so that a way could be made to save us. We did not and still do not deserve God's salvation. But God has made salvation real for us at no cost to us, but at great cost to himself. Amen. This is grace, a free and unmerited gift of forgiveness from Almighty God. Paid for at the cross of Jesus Christ, where the wrath and curse for our sins was laid upon Christ. And as I think about grace as I was preparing this message, I tried to think about what comes to my mind first and I thought of the grace of mothers when I try to imagine what grace looks like I think of mothers when a baby is hungry his mother feeds him when a baby makes a mess his mother cleans him up when a baby is sick his mother stays up and watches over him closely when a baby needs to sleep, his mother rocks him and sings him to sleep. Now, a baby is incapable of demanding or earning this grace, this love from his mother. It is by his mother's grace that a baby lives. And in a very real sense, a child takes this grace for granted because he is simply incapable of understanding what is being given to him. He simply lives in a world where grace has always been granted. And we are no different than these babies. Every breath we breathe has 26 sextillion molecules we need to survive. Just long enough to take one more. And we've been breathing them many, many millions of breaths 
with scarcely any point where we stop and think that we didn't have to be given that air to breathe. There are 30 trillion living cells in our body working together to per perform all kinds of functions like sight, uh, feeling pain, uh, the sensations of, of all your senses, amen? Uh, making blood flow through your body, taking oxygen out of, the, out of your blood, millions and millions and millions of things happening every moment in your body. And it doesn't have to happen. That's grace of God that you're alive. The earth has breathable air, drinkable water, edible plants and meats and other nutrients. I dare say that every trillionth of a second, a trillion blessings happen Amen, that give us life. Amen. And it isn't by accident. It is all by design. And that is what grace really is because none of us have earned it and none of us deserve it. Mm -hmm. It should go without saying, by grace we live, and by grace we may be saved. The next thing we're going to look at is, because we're already covered by grace, the next thing is through faith. Amen? So if you want to go to, oh, you're already there. We're still going to be in Romans 5. Now, in Brother Glenn's last sermon, he talked a lot about faith. And today I want to just talk a little bit more about what faith exactly is. Amen? Faith is not an option for us, but it is the whole of how we are to live our lives. Without faith, we all miss our salvation, waste our lives, and likely take others with us to hell. Faith is that important. So let us strive to understand exactly what faith is. And we're still going to be in Romans 5, but we're going to back up to verse 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. One thing that may jump out to you, we see right here that faith is counted as righteousness by God. The secular word world has perverted that word faith. They try to insert blind before it. And any time a believer says faith, what they hear is blind faith. However, that's not true. That's not, what, that's not the definition of faith at all. The atheist often thinks themselves above faith as if the sciences were largely made up of objective truths, meaning absolute truths, and that is not true either. Faith in the Bible is not blind faith at all. Rather, it is reasonable faith. I can demonstrate this uh, by telling you a story that happened at work without naming any names. <clears throat> There's a person there that I had uh, tried to talk to and minister to, and he would try to, you know, promote his worldview to me. And we had this back and forth going. And any time I mentioned faith, he said, oh, I don't need faith, I have facts. And I told him <clears throat> that uh, faith, the faith I'm talking about involves facts, it's reasonable. He said, no, the faith you're talking about has no facts. And so I told him, can I demonstrate to you where you're wrong and I'm right? Every now and then that works. <laughs> And so he said I could, and it was just one guy sitting in a chair, so I don't have uh, one person sitting in a chair here. But I had people sitting in pews, right? Now all of you came in here and sat down in them pews, correct? Did anybody lay down on the floor and make sure that the legs on them pews were good? 
Did anybody check the screws to make sure they wasn't going to? I'm not going to talk about how heavy anybody is. But some of these pews have a lot of weight on them. Amen? <laughs> and so he's sitting there in his chair all lean back, just like you're sitting in the pew all comfortable. And I'm telling him, now tell me right now, do you have 100% certainty when you sat down in that chair that it wasn't going to fall and drop you on the floor? 100%. And he said, no, I did not. I said, well, you sat in that chair by faith. Amen? And everyone in this room lives their life in exactly that way. We all live, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, by faith. We have reasons to believe that the things we're doing are going to be beneficial to us or someone else. Amen? If we didn't, we would think that it would waste our time and we wouldn't do it. Amen? So every choice we make is based on facts and faith, which makes faith a reasonable thing. Part of everyone's life, whether you believe it or not. And as I thought about faith, and I tried to find something to uh, connect it to, I thought about Abraham way back in the beginning of the story of really how all of us came to be believers. <clears throat> so we don't have to turn there because it's only one verse but in Genesis 15 6 God tells us Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness note that it says Abram not Abraham meaning this is so early in the story of Abraham that God hadn't even changed his name yet God had just started speaking to him Abraham had just started doing what God told him to do, Abram, and God counted it as righteousness. The same thing that was said here in Romans to us, that our faith is counted as righteousness. Now, Abram was born in a place that worshipped Mesopotamian idols. I may have mispronounced that. Amen? He did not have the scriptures. The Bible had not yet been written. Now, he came from a place, a city called Ur, and it's famous for being a great port city on the Persian Gulf, famous for its megalithic structure that still exists, the ziggurat of Ur. Now, you can look that up. They've excavated it. It is an impressive structure. I mean, multi-tiered, just like, think of the pyramids, but a little bit more flat. I mean, it's... It's crazy what people were able to build 4,000 years ago. And that was built at the time of Abram. So this is where he come from. Yet he left everything behind to go to the land of Canaan, a much lower, less civilized place than he's from. So the secularists may ask, how is this not blind faith? Because Abraham had no scriptures. He had no stories of, of the people God had led before him, right? He'd come from this great advanced civilization and he'd go into a far lower one. How is that not blind faith for him to leave all of that behind, family, possessions, everything, and go to this other place? I'll tell you how it's not blind faith because God spoke to him. Amen? Amen? What greater evidence could there be to convince us to do something, but for God to say, yo, you, get up and go. The, I mean, God's never spoken to me like that, amen? And, uh, but he did to Abraham. So Abraham did not have blind faith. He may have had more faith than any of us because God was directly speaking to him, amen? And the Bible says that God counted that as righteousness. Very important. I would never ask any of you to put blind faith in anything. To the contrary, I believe that putting our faith in Jesus Christ is the most reasonable thing we can do. I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't true. I lived 10 years as an atheist trying to challenge and trip up Christians and sadly enjoying it even though in my heart it troubled me why I enjoyed that. 
I didn't just become a believer and leave that questioning part aside. I still question and search and find evidences and answers. And I'm more convinced today than I've ever been before that putting my faith in Jesus Christ is the most reasonable, life-changing thing I've done or anyone else can do. But the Bible says in the Old Testament and the New that when we put our faith in God, God counts us as righteousness. But what does that mean? We're not going to read the scriptures, but it goes on to tell us that it's actually Christ's righteousness being imparted to us because we don't have righteousness. Amen. We're sinners. So, but when we put our faith in Christ, God takes Christ's righteousness and puts it on us. Now, I don't know if there's a mathematical, I mispronounced that for sure, <laughs> formula for this, but that's the way God works. Amen? So we've looked at grace. We've looked at faith. I want to look at Christ. Amen? And we can go to Acts chapter 4. And we're going to be in verse 5 through 12. I'll give you a little backstory. John and Peter have gone to the temple, and there was a uh, a lame man there, and uh, he was begging. And they said, uh, "You know, money we don't have to give to you, but what we do have." Basically, they told him to stand up and walk in Jesus' name, and he did. And so, when they go into the temple, this paralyzed man that everyone knew had been sitting out there for years is jumping and dancing and praising Jesus. <clears throat> and it caused all kind of controversy. And the leaders of the Jewish, the Jewish leaders had uh, John and Peter apprehended. So that's where we're going to pick up. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Seliphas, John, and Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. After they had Peter and John stand before them, they asked the question, By what power and what name have you done this? Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you here today healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. <clears throat> Christ's name can preach, amen? Christ's name can heal, amen? And Christ's name can save. And Christ's name can also cause our faith to be tested. Consider Peter and John at the temple, the lame man jumping and and dancing and praising God had got the attention of everyone there. Peter's preaching before he was apprehended, he preached, made the connection for them that everything Christ had said was true and was coming to pass right before their very eyes. 5,000 people became saved that day. Now this isn't just any 5,000 people. These are the very people that were rejecting Jesus the whole time. As a result, Peter and John were apprehended and brought before the Jewish leadership. Now, did Peter and John cower away from their beliefs in the face of persecution? 
No, they did not. Did Peter and John lie to save their lives? No, they did not. They did the only thing they knew to do. They trusted in the only name under heaven by which anyone may be saved, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in closing, we began today with Marpaul, right? And then followed that connection all the way back to Abraham. Returning to Marpaul Baptist Church again, God has specific purposes for this church, and his primary purpose is this, to bring the good news of the gospel to a lost, dying, um, sinful world. Amen? We must continually preach that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. We must recognize who God says we are, where God took us from, and where God is leading us to. Like mothers who nurture their babies with constant love, we are to have abundant grace for those who don't understand what we believe. Like Abraham, we are to live our lives in faith, recognizing that God gives us trillions of reasons to believe in him every day. Like Peter, we are to trust in Jesus Christ always, for we were, we were created through him, by him, and for him to do good works, which God prepared before time even existed, for us to walk in them. By grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, even an atheist such as myself was saved. By grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, God has saved everyone in here who is saved. And uh, right now, you may not notice it, but there's a camera in the back, which means this video will be on YouTube, right? And uh, I'd like y'all to pray for that because a lot of people watch it. Yes, I wish more people would watch it. Amen. So if you see it, feel, f feel free to share it. But I'm going to do this next part a little differently. We're going to have an invitation here. But I want to acknowledge that real people do watch these videos. And I want to give them a chance to respond as well as you. Amen. So if everyone could bow their heads with no one looking around. First, I would acknowledge the people in here. If there's anyone in here who's heard this message and realized that they need Jesus Christ, that they want to put their faith in Jesus Christ today, if you would raise your hand. Okay, and now... For anyone who is, uh, who is also at home watching this on the video and anyone who may be in here, <clears throat> I would like to lead y'all in a prayer, if you would just pray with me. We all can pray it. Holy God, in Jesus' name, I come before you, Lord, and acknowledge my sins. I ask you, Lord, to save me this day as I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And by your grace, through my faith in Jesus Christ, I am saved. I ask you, Lord, to lead me all my days to serve and follow you and you only in Jesus name Amen now if there's anyone here today who said that prayer and meant it for the first time and would like to come forward I invite you now to do so. And if there's anyone uh, watching this at home, I invite them to begin to share their new faith with those they know and love and to find a church 
and to get baptized, amen, and to begin their walk in Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. With that, I close in prayer. Holy Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for Mar Paul Baptist Church. I thank you for these hundred years that so many people have faithfully served you here. I pray for a hundred more. Above all, I pray for the return of Jesus Christ and make all things right, new, and holy again. In his name, we pray, trust, and obey. Amen.